Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Previously we discussed the theory of important sampling and the mathematical derivation of the sampling patterns used for pre-filtering the diffuse and specular BRDFs of an environment cube map. We already implemented pre-filtering of the diffuse component. So today, armed with the knowledge that we gained from the last two videos, we are going to implement the specular component. Before looking at the code, I'm going to show you the result compared to what we had before. As I mentioned, we had the diffuse component already done, but looking at the specular part, we see that it's just a MIP chain which looks increasingly blocky for higher MIP levels. With the specular part implemented, we can re-import this texture, and this time the result is much softer, as if the image is being reflected by a rough surface, which is what we wanted. And here is one more texture. Let's look at the implementation, starting with the compute shader for pre-filtering. I added a new shader in envmapprocessing.hlsl for the specular pre-filtering. Let's look at it in VS Code for the sake of readability. As you can see, this is almost an exact copy of the shader function for the diffuse part, except here we call a different function for sampling the cube map hemisphere. Remember that this code is executed for each pixel of the target cube map. The pixel position determines the sampling direction, also known as the normal direction. We pass this vector together with the roughness value to the sampling function. The roughness value is given in this member of the constant buffer. Therefore, we can see that this shader is run for multiple roughness values. We'll see how this is implemented in the C++ code in a minute. The result is then written to the target cube map using the thread indices and the cube map face number. Now let's look at pre-filter envmap function, which we also discussed in the previous video. I still have to clean this up a little bit, like removing this unnecessary variable. One thing that's different from what we saw before is the addition of this part which determines the MIP level of the source cube map to sample from. This is done in order to reduce the noise from high frequency light sources. I can in fact show you what happens when we disable this block and instead always sample from the most detailed MIP level. Here we can see that after re-importing the texture, it now contains a lot of noise. Even images without high frequency lights still have a bit of noise in their pre-filtered result. Please see the frostbite paper for more information on how this works. Next, I removed the multiplication with the cost theta variable that I accidentally left in these functions for diffuse pre-filtering. Here is again the pre-filter envmap function and the ggx important sampling function, which I also explained in the previous video. It maps a pair of uniform random values to uniform phi and non-uniform theta angles according to the ggx mapping that we calculated by integrating the probability density function. It then converts these polar angles to a vector in Cartesian coordinates, which represents the half-wave vector. The power of 4 function is defined here. We can also use the HLSL function, but sometimes that would give me a strange result, so I defined my own. And finally, the ggx normal distribution function, which is an exact copy of the one we used for physically based rendering. Looking at the equation for this, we see that although it's mathematically equivalent, the implementation uses a different order of calculating the terms. This is a common trick to help the compiler with optimizing the code by using less GPU instructions. 
Here we see that we have a multiplication followed by the addition of a negative number. The result is again multiplied and followed by an addition. This is so common that it has its own instruction called the multiply add or mat instruction. Writing the equation like this will increase the chances that the GPU will use just two multiply add instructions to calculate it instead of two multiplications and two additions. Okay, that's all I added in the shader file. In order to compile it, it needs to be added in the batch file that's run at build time. This will output an include file which we can paste in our C++ source code. This way we have now access to the compiled shader bytecode. I reduced the size of the diffuse prefiltered cube maps since it was too large for the amount of details it contains. Even at a size of 32 pixels, it's probably still larger than needed. Nothing else changed in this file except at the very end where I added a function that dispatches the new compute shader. This is a chunk of new code, so we can just look at the actual source code. This function is very similar to the one for the diffuse component. Because of this similarity and the fact that I already explained the code for the diffuse part, I'm going to move a bit faster through this code. The main difference is that it runs the compute shader multiple times for each MIP level that corresponds to a roughness value. Here again we create the source cube map and upload it to the GPU. We also create the output cube map that will contain the compute shader result and another cube map for downloading the results. When creating the output cube map texture, we use the specular cube map size, which is a constant with a value of 256 pixels. For the number of MIP levels, we use another constant that's based on roughness values that we want to prefilter for. We defined this constant to be 6, so this texture can contain prefilter results that correspond to roughness values 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. The compute shader is created as before using the newly added bytecode. We create a constant buffer, but we'll set the constants later for each roughness level and according to the MIP level that's being processed. Next, for each cube map that we have to process, we create a shader resource view so that it can be accessed by the compute shader. Then we prefilter it multiple times using different roughness values. Note that we skip roughness 0, since that's the same as the source cube map. We'll copy the source cube map to the first MIP level of the resulting cube map after processing other MIP levels. For each MIP level in the target cube map, we create an unordered access view. This way, the compute shader can write the results to the appropriate sub resource. Now it's time for filling in the constant buffer. While doing so, we calculate the output size which depends on the current MIP level. We also calculate the roughness that goes with this MIP level. Dispatching the compute shader happens in the same way as before, where we calculate the block size and call the dispatch function. After all cube maps have been processed, we download the results from the GPU and read them into a scratch image. I explained all these functions in previous episodes, so I'm skipping to the parts that are new. As I mentioned, we copied the most detailed MIP level from the source cube maps, since pre-filtering for a perfectly smooth surface would result in an identical image. This way we save some time and energy. In textureimporter.cpp we add a forward declaration for the new function, so that it can be called. Then here is an improvement to run on GPU function, which now returns the result of the function that's being called here. This way we can handle the failure when the function for some reason didn't succeed. For example, here in this lambda expression we return a boolean based on the result of the call to this function. Here I fixed the bug that was preventing MIP maps from being generated in some situations. So the code now looks like this.
and here is again the run on GPU function. Now that we implemented pre-filtering for the specular component, we can call that function here instead of returning the source cube map. And again we return whether the operation was successful or not. These were all the updates to texture importer.cpp. We have another bug fix in helpers.cs. In order to determine the number of bytes per channel, we also have to include the block compression formats. Although we always get an uncompressed image to be displayed in the editor, we still get the format of the asset as it was imported. So for textures with block compression, we get the BC format. We can still determine the number of bytes per channel that's used for the uncompressed image, since all but the BC6 format will be decompressed using 8 bits per channel formats. BC6 will be always displayed as 32-bit float format. So by adding these here, we can still display the images. Here I removed checking for formats having 3 bytes per pixel, since that obviously doesn't exist. Image formats are always either 1 byte per pixel or a multiple of 2 bytes per pixel. I guess I was led astray by this format here, somehow. I removed this block since it's identical to the case for 16 byte formats. So I added this condition here. Next is texture.cs, where I only added a bug. That's right, my mind slipped and I added a bug here. I was meaning to add this for when the IBL pair couldn't be found in the asset registry. I already fixed it for the next episode, as you can see here, so it should be like this. In contenttoolsapi.cs, I moved these two lines down because we want to first update the import settings, which are referred to in the setData method. We also throw an exception if setData fails. And this is what the import method currently looks like. Finally, I added these debug symbols to the Primal Editor project file so that it won't skip debug assertions while debugging. And that's all for this episode of the Game Engine programming series. In the next episode, we'll do the final part of CubeMap pre-filtering and finish the implementation of image-based lighting in Primal Engine. Thank you as always for joining me and I'll see you next time.